So uh, with this interview, I'm just going to ask you about um, your perspective of this event from uh, pretty much from when you assumed command to when it started okay. uh, or when you fr found out about the, the incident and how you reacted and sure. how everything played out. So um, you had just assumed command of CTF, correct? Just a couple of days, yes. Okay. Can you explain uh, what CTF is and what the responsibilities were of that command? Um, the Counter Piracy Task Force, CTF 151, had just uh, been put together and been around about six weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer, and we had been under the command of uh, um, Rear Admiral uh, McKnight, who was the first person to, as the Admiral, to stand it up with his staff. There had been a UN um, Security Council resolution um, authorizing governments to work together to fight piracy and to be able to go uh, into the territorial waters of Somalia to fight piracy. Uh, and so the uh, NAV sent said we're going to stand up a task force and ask our coalition partners to join us so that we have an organization to disrupt piracy uh, and to tackle piracy. And it was primarily focused in the Gulf of Aden. And that was uh, 2009. It, no, January of 2009, it, they stood up, and I took command in April of 2009. Okay. So you had uh, you'd been in command just a couple of days. Yes. You found out about the situation. Yep. The Battle Watch called me up and notified me that uh, Maersk, Alabama, had been hijacked. A U.S. flagship had been hijacked by pirates. So that was the initial report. And then within an hour or two, we had the reports that it was a U.S. American, Captain Phillips, who'd been taken and put on a life raft under the control of pirates. So what, what was your reaction to this, to this situation? Uh, start making best speed towards the situation. We were actually in the Gulf of Aden, and the kidnapping happened in the Somali Basin. Um, I was reassigned USS Bainbridge, and she was closest to where the kidnapping had taken place, so she was making best speed to try and intercept uh, the life raft and the Maersk, Alabama, and we were working our way around the Horn of Africa to join up with her. So was the initial plan to have the Bainbridge intercept the pirates, or was your Bainbridge was warfare? closest, so she was going to be on scene first. Okay. So part of it is the Somali coastline is about 2,600 nautical miles long. So when you're talking about counter piracy and the waters from the Gulf of Aden across the Horn of Africa into the Somali Basin, you're talking about 2.8 square million miles. So to put that in context, it's like trying to patrol the United States from Newport, Rhode Island to San Diego. And so then when you have that much area and that much opportunity for activity, you've got to get to where the activity is first. And if you don't happen to be right on top of the activity, it'll take you a, a few days to get there. Okay. So what, what was next? How, uh, what happened next with the story? So, so uh, Bainbridge got on scene and we started to get the reports of uh, where the Maersk was, uh, a better sense of what was happening, confirmation that, yes, the pirates uh, had kidnapped an American and he was on the life raft. We started, we had already been developing uh, information, collecting in, uh, intelligence using uh, the Marine Corps assets and P3 assets to get pattern of life on the pirates, understanding if there was any other activity or events that were going on, but we continued we continued that work, as well as collating information from coalition partners on what they knew. Uh, Bainbridge had a scan eagle that they could monitor the life raft. Uh, and then, uh, fortunate for us, they also happened to have a Somali interpreter on board. So they were very early able to make uh, communications with the pirates and uh, start talking to them about they needed to uh, surrender, you know, if they surrendered, nothing would happen to them, and to return Captain Phillips to, uh, to the U.S. Okay. 
Can you explain what a stand eagle is? It's a uh, unmanned uh, aerial vehicle comes off the flight deck of a smaller surface combatant and uh, uh, gives you video of, of whatever you're trying to watch. I was in charge of a piracy mission. That means you are trying to disrupt piracy throughout that entire AOR. There were other piracy events going on at the same time throughout the course of the days and even before and after Master Phillips was kidnapped. So clearly, a kidnapped American was the number one mission that we were focused on and working, but that was not my only responsibility at the time. And so I'm on a large ship with, with uh, significant command and control capability because I'm communicating with other ships throughout the uh, area of operations and doing what we need to do in terms of, of um, disrupting piracy, trying to uh, uh, detain pirates and then tr get them turned over to other countries for legal prosecution. Mm -hmm. So it, I know we're f we get focused on this mission, but that's not what a, st a strike group commander just doesn't do, do one thing at one time. Mm -hmm. And clearly, unbelievably significant mission. You were communicating with uh, the NAVSEC commander. Oh, absolutely. I was communicating with Admiral Gortney. We were walking through. So uh, let, let me talk. Yeah, that's fine. You you got you'll be able to figure out. Mm -hmm. are, I'll, you're, I'll let you talk. Uh, are you still rolling? Yes. Okay. So some of the challenges we have up front: um, our conventional forces, uh, our sailors and Marines, uh, ships, and our assets. We're not negotiators. And so when you think about someone being kidnapped. It's, in this country, it's normally the FBI that does the negotiation. Well, one of our uh, initial challenges is you want to get this person back, Captain Phillips back, and preferably you want to get him back safely and you want to detain the pirates. They're criminals at, at this point, suspected criminals. And so the first thing you want to try with the kidnap victim is try and negotiate the person back. We didn't have any FBI negotiators out there at sea. So what happened is in the early days, uh, there was a working group that was set up in the United States and then working with um, NAVSENT and their team, we started to work through uh, conversations uh, and dialogue that the CEO of the ship, uh, uh, the intelligence specialist, and whoever else he designated, the conversation they needed started to have with the pirates who kidnapped Captain Phillips, working their way through the logic of, it's in your best interest if you let him go. All this had to be done as we negotiated uh, for his safe release. At the same time, it had to be translated by uh, the Somali translator who was on board Baybridge. And so when you talk about the wonderful intellect and um, a, a, adaptiveness, agility of our people, they're taking on the role of negotiation, just like they're a professional FBI agent, trying to convince people to let go of this human being and, and at a minimum, stop moving the life raft, stop trying to get ashore. And that, that was our concern in the first few hours. The life raft is heading towards the shore of Somalia. And if we couldn't stop the life raft from um, getting ashore, we were probably not going to get Master Phillips, uh, Master is the technical term merchants use, Captain Phillips back. My concern is if the pirates got ashore in Somalia, had Master Phillips captured, once he went into Somalia, we would not, it would be very, very hard to locate him again and find him and make it much harder and less likely that we get him back home safely to America. So the, the big pieces for me was getting that life raft to stop moving, convince the pirates to turn him back over, uh, and hopefully, you know, arrest them, get FBI out there, send them back to be prosecuted for a crime of kidnapping. Um, and that was our initial intent. 
in the first literally 24 to 36 hours. Throughout um, the operation, was there uh, anything that seemed, uh, or looking back, is there anything that was especially impressive or unbelievable to you? Yes. So in the end, we had um, um, a DDG, a frigate, and then we had the big deck amphib that I was embarked on. You have the uh, air elements associated with the uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit. And so when you think about it, and then we had P3 flights coming out of Djibouti, you think about all of those uh, assets working together to keep track of the life raft, um, make sure we understood as much as possible, 24 hours a day, what was going on, the negotiation process, the continuing collection of uh, pirates' activities outside of the life raft across the ocean and, and in Somalia. In the end, that's probably across a big deck amphib, the P3s, uh, the other two ships, we're talking four or 5,000 sailors and Marines, a um, couple Coast Guard men, and a couple of folks from the other services. For all of those military people to be working together uh, on a mission, uh, a rescue, com you know, kidnapping, rescue at sea, that I don't think up until that point we had trained together to ever do. It was very remarkable. The, the leaders and the crews were very focused on the mission. Everybody was very intent on getting Captain Phillips back. And I don't think there was, whether they were um, a sailor uh, working in the mess decks, a sailor or, or airman up on the flight deck, in CIC or in the back of that P3, there was nobody who was not focused on that mission. And I think in the end, that's what set us up for success in getting him back. But when you think about it, there's not that many organizations in the world that could bring that many people together and get something done so well and, and in my mind so perfectly. And that is reaffirmation of what the greatness is that lies in our sailors and Marines. Absolutely. Can you talk a little bit about um, the importance of operating forward and uh, war fighting first and be ready? So when I started off, I talked about the uh, geographic scope of the counter piracy mission going from the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden to the Somali Basin. So when you think about our world, uh, and how long it takes to go across the water at 20 or 30 knots. Uh, when something happens, if you're not there, it takes too long to get there if you're coming from home base. So the only way to make a difference in the life of that American citizen or the life of other American citizens in the future or uh, Indonesia, in my case, is a perfect example. Going in and helping the people after the tsunami is you have to be somewhere in the vicinity of what's happened in order to steam as quickly as you can and make things go the way they should be or help people. Uh, and presence means you're already there. You're, you're either for deployed uh, FDNF in Japan or you're steaming around the Gulf of Aden or Somalia or in the Mediterranean and you're there. So that when someone says, this is the mission I need you to do, it literally within a few hours or maybe at the most a couple of days, you can go in and make a difference. Absolutely. Okay. So war fighting first, I guess, also plays into uh, having yes. a presence. Yes, so warfighting first is understanding what it is we need to be as warfighters, whether it's the capability of our ships, uh, and that is got to be our primary focus every day, being the best warfighters we can be. Okay. All right, so uh, in regards to this situation, ma'am, in the future, what do you want sailors to know about this operation? as it becomes part of the Navy's heritage and history? They should remember um, 
how well the sailors and Marines performed and how well they worked together, how well everybody did their job. So there's, uh, in the sense of heritage, and heritage saying, I want to be as good as the people who came before me. Uh, you know, the wonderful piece about this story is when you think about the USS Bainbridge being named after the original Bainbridge, who was the original counter piracy leader <laughs> uh, off of Tripoli, there's this standard of we protect. Uh, America's citizens and we protect America's property uh, and in this case fighting pirates was one of the missions where we do that protection so you have the Bainbridge as a standard whose name becomes the USS Bainbridge you have the sailors of the Bainbridge and the boxer uh, becoming a standard for future sailors to go I want to uphold that standard when my time comes when my mission comes where I have to be my best uh, the other thing is thinking about Captain Phillips, that when you look at individual heroism, here's a leader who uh, said, take me if you leave my crew. I'm willing to be kidnapped. Just leave my crew alone. That each of us, we think about the broader legacy of, of, of that kidnapping will remember that and go, when my turn comes and I'm tested, I hope I want to be able to do the right thing that Captain Phillips did. And think about the people I'm here to, my, my shipmates, that my shipmates come first and I will do the right thing by my shipmates. And that is also of an important legacy of the entire mission. Yes, ma'am. Regarding um, very tense, is there any advice that you would have for future naval leaders? I think the focus, when you have a mission like this, the focus is naturally there. And uh, as I mentioned before, I found that to be true. Um, you have to uh, give yourself time to think uh, and so there's some of it that is immediate and natural reaction that gets the entire team moving in the right direction. But you have to carve out time and teams to think about approaches uh, so that while the mission's going on, you're trying to get two or three steps ahead and have plans and uh, responses for the, next, for the next three or four things that are gonna happen. And so leaders have to figure out how to carve out the time to, while you're in the middle of it, to think ahead, but also to balance everything else that they've got going on. Because for every important mission, there's probably three or four subset missions that are going on, and then there's other missions that you also have oversight over that. It's just as important that they're successful as well. Is there anything else that you would like to add about this? Uh, no. Can I ask one question? Sure. Um, I'll ask and if you just look at the answer. Sure. Um, so, Captain Phillips was rescued. What's going through your mind? You know, it's a big sigh, I'm sure, of relief. It wasn't a sigh, it was like, a, yes! <laughs> <laughs> and it was, uh, we were in a meeting, uh, we were actually looking at piracy, uh, sort of a campaign perspective writ large. The Battle Watch was uh, monitoring the lifeboat and uh, uh, Bainbridge, and they had uh, uh, they had taken the pirate leader on board, and that conversation was going on. So uh, we were in a meeting uh, on piracy writ large, looking at a way ahead when the word came in, and everyone was like, "Yes, we've got him back." One more question. Yeah. So. You're not going to move your mouth when she's talking, are you? <laughs> <laughs> It'd be so cool. All right. So that, that task force had been set up in 2009, the first few weeks, and that was really one of the pinnacle events of in a piracy in that region and really set the standard. And, and you know, years later now, piracy in that region has significantly declined. What can you attribute that to? And you, know, you really set this, you and the rest of the ship there and the team, the task force, and the partnership really set the, the standard there. Can you talk a little bit about um, what we 
Team. So I think your last word, partnerships, pretty key. Uh, the coalitions working together. There's a NATO task force out there, uh, a European Urine Task Force, and CTF-151 is still enduring uh, and has been commanded by our partners uh, of uh, Singapore, um, um, New Zealand, uh, uh, Turkey. So multiple partners have had command of 151. And so working together as a team, bringing all that capability together uh, as really, uh, and synchronizing all that capability uh, has been a key factor in piracy uh, diminishing. The other big thing is uh, um, the uh, commercial ships bringing on board their own security teams. And so as the pirates have gone to attack the ships, their security teams have disrupted the pirates and the pirates have just uh, driven away. Uh, and so uh, the ships themselves, the commercial ships, uh, having a little bit um, of capability themselves has helped diminish counter piracy. And so we've gone from having uh, dozens upon dozens of ships uh, under uh, um, pirate control held for ransom down to zero. We still have um, hostages, but they've been moved to shore, but the numbers are, are much smaller than they were in the last few years. Can okay. I ask a question now? Absolutely. Um, Do I still have to look at yes. uh, <laughs> cousin, <laughs> cousin Phillips, basically, <laughs> Captain Phillips, all right. So throughout the whole whole thing, um, there's going to be a lot of emotions going through, and you know obviously there's going to be fear, confusion, and everything. But as a, um, I know I think you touched upon it a little bit, but I want to expound on it. Hopefully, um, did um, how did you overcome it as a as a leader of all these all these chess pieces? Ah. Uh. Yeah. Well, first first of all, what kind of emotions were going through you when? I, I give our sailors and marines credit for being professionals and certainly as you're en route to a mission there's some excitement. I don't think fear was an emotion that I felt going through the crew. So uh, I think people uh, very quickly uh, sense of what's going on, wanting to know what's going on, wanted to know what their role was going to be. and. Uh, very eager to get what is it I need to do to help and then uh, enthusiastically all of them got after what they needed to do. Yeah. Oh yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your coverage? Right, so you know it's amazing uh, how quickly some things seem to change. So we were in uh, desert camouflage uh, in 2009, the Navy had just started to roll out uh, the NWUs, and we were doing it command by command starting in the United States. So I and my staff were uh, still wearing DCUs when we embarked on the Boxer. Uh, and, and from the photographs from that time frame, you can tell, because there's pictures of us in this uniform and the sailors are in blue coveralls, and uh, you've got a few folks in the, the new NWUs at the time. And so then, of course, we're no longer wearing this uniform. So this may have been one of the last uh, major, that year, 2009, going on, probably one of the last major years we were wearing this uniform. Uh, and it sort of closes out a era for me, because we started wearing this uniform uh, coming into OIF, and now we've completely changed out. But if the uniform going away represents piracy going away, that's a good thing. Okay. Yeah, I didn't realize um, how big a deal it was. Because you're at sea, you're in the mission, um, you know, you. You uh, start seeing some of the television stuff, and I, you know, I did a couple radio interviews because I'm at sea, and then you're on to the next big mission, and uh, it wasn't until um, I had to fly back to the United States for uh, um, 
um, an event, and I'm over, uh, it's the Congressional Black Caucus, and I'm going to go speak. I'm going to be back in the United States for 96 hours. We'd gone ashore and, uh, in Bahrain, and I walked into the room and got a standing ovation just by walking into the room, and I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> And Lieutenant Mendez, who's my aide, goes, I think you're a rock star, but nobody <laughs> told us. <laughs> I mean, I think that plays into what you're saying. You know, this is our job. This is a day-to-day -day activity for, you know, the Navy. This is what we do.